Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this video on electoral systems. And to be more specific, we are looking at the arguments for and against first past the post, which is the um, electoral system that we use for general elections in the United Kingdom. Um, this is the third video and in this particular series, and I expect that you will have already seen the video that talks about what first past the post is and defines um, what an electoral system is. Um, I'm sitting behind a rather bright window today, so I'm going to be a little bit silhouetted. So for that reason, I will um, shrink down um, the video of me um, and so you can focus more on the um, uh, the arguments we're going to be talking about and I think someone might be coming in in a minute to um, clean something in this room so we'll, we'll just roll with it uh, whatever we get so our first slide is going to be looking at the arguments that say first past the post is great and we should keep it and the second slide is going to be looking at uh, why it's not so good and why we should not keep it you need to kind of form your own view here about which side of this debate um, you are on. It's a, a fairly kind of common practice question or even real exam question asking you to compare first past the post. And even if you get an exam question that compares first past the post with, with other electoral systems, um, this is still going to be the main kind of thrust of your um, essay because obviously it is the system that we use for our general elections. It is the system which has probably the biggest impact on the results that we get. So here we go. The first argument for first past the post is it is easy to understand. It is simple. You put a cross in a box and, um, and then whoever gets the most votes wins. Um, and that is a strength because when David Cameron was, doing, was trying to persuade the United Kingdom to keep first the past the post, he gave the description that I just gave you and then he read out some of the descriptions of some of the others. And when, you, when we start studying, studying the others like AB and AMS and whatever, you'll see there is a complexity to them. And whilst I'm sure everyone does have the ability to understand them, they're not instantly understandable. And certainly when you're kind of looking at an election and, and asking the question, well, why did that person win here? Or why is this representative here? It's a lot easier to understand them in a system like first past the post. And it is perhaps important in a democracy that everyone feels secure with their electoral system and everyone feels that they understand why a particular person has got a seat and why a particular person has not got a seat um, in, in a particular constituency. So the simplicity of the system is one of its strengths. And also, it is possible to mess up your ballot paper. So I, I mentioned in the previous video that if you write your name on the top of it, then your ballot paper is, is discounted because it has to be anonymous. But likewise, it's possible to just fill out a ballot paper wrong, especially in some of the more complicated systems. And if you fill out the ballot paper wrong, the person that's counting your votes may decide that they can't judge what your preference was, and so your vote will be discounted. And the word for that is a spoiled ballot paper, a spoiled ballot paper. First past the post has shown itself to be one of the systems that leads to the least amount of spoiled ballot papers because it is so straightforward. And there is an argument to be made here that a democratic system should allow anyone and everyone, no matter of their, you know, their ability, their intelligence, their age, um, to access an election, to access a vote, and to understand um, what is taking place. The second argument that goes for first, the post, first past the post, and in a way this is related to the first point, is that it gives a quick result. Um, you've probably never stayed up on an election night, but you should, it's fun. Um, when you get first past the post, the, the, all the votes are counted on election night, so the same day effectively, or the same evening, and you have the result by the next morning. And in many cases, you have the result by kind of like 1 a.m., 2 a.m because it's a straightforward system. All you've got to do is count the votes, and whoever's got the most votes wins, wins and whoever has the most constituencies tends to form the, the, the next government. It's very straightforward and it's fast, and so there's no period of uncertainty about who the next government will be. Now, if we compare that to, say, what happened in America with um, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, there was an uncertainty for about a week over who had won the election. If we go to some other European countries where they have more proportional systems, um, you might get a, uh, a vote, as in you'll know how many votes have been cast, but sometimes there then requires a lot of a period where parties have to work together. I hope you know what a coalition is, and a, and a coalition is where parties have to make deals with other parties to form governments together. Those deals take time, and so um, first past the post tends to avoid that process. It, get, it gives more or less kind of a certainty of who the next government will be. The only time it didn't in 2010 
it did take, I think it was like 13 days or 10 days or something. I can't remember the exact number of days, but it, it took a number of days before the Liberal Democrats and the um, Conservatives agreed on, upon their deal. Um, and first past the post, normally nine times out of 10 or even nine, 99 times out of 100, gives a quick result um, and a certainty over who the next leader of the um, government will be and which party that will be from. The next argument for first past the post is that each individual MP is accountable. The picture I've used here is of Ed Balls, um, who used to be uh, the Labour shadow chancellor, I think, and at one point I think he was in education as well. Um, he lost his seat in the 2015 election. I think, I think I've got that one right. Um, and despite being a very important figure in the Labour Party at that time, I believe he was Deputy Chancellor, that, that's a big deal. Um, and under first past the post, every single MP has a constituency and every single MP can be voted out or in by the people that live in, in that constituency. Now, I know we've talked in the previous video about safe seats and safe seats are a real thing, but theoretically, every single MP can be removed by the people that live in their constituency. There is no way to kind of protect an MP um, from, from, from the voters. Um, whereas in other systems, the, uh, you, there's, the, there's a system called party list that we'll be looking at in, 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 a, in a few lessons time. And in the party list system, the, the party gets to decide which MPs are, are given seats you know they're basically the party is essentially told oh you've got 20 seats and then the party goes well we want this person this person this person and so on the the advantage here of first past the post is that every single member of parliament is individually accountable to their constituents and no mp is completely safe from the electorate the reality of course is slightly different because you do get safe seats where it's, it's highly unlikely to happen but potentially it's there now, one of the big advantages which MPs often talk about, if you say to an MP, you know, should we keep first past the post? One of the arguments they often bring up is, is this one, and it's very important to them, which is the MP constituency link, which we talked about a little bit when we did the legis legislature um, unit. Because each MP is responsible for a specific area, whether that's Beaconfield or, or Watford or, or, or somewhere in Scotland or Hemel Hempstead, whatever it might be. Every single MP is responsible for a particular area. They represent the people there. They look out for the interests there. They look out for building projects that are taking place there. If you've got a concern, you, have, you know who your MP is and you can go and speak to them. And this is known as the MP constituency link. Every MP is tied to a particular area because that is the area that has actually voted them in. And the argument that MPs often give for this being the most important part of first past the post is it means that there is always local representation in Westminster. So when the whole of Parliament gets together and they are voting on a particular issue, there will be someone there saying, well, what about Hemel Hempstead? What about York? What about Warwick? Um, and you know, if there are particular circumstances in which your area would be adversely affected, an example here might be something like uh, issues like the Heathrow runway, additional Heathrow runway, HS2. You know, there are MPs that are looking out for those particular areas. And uh, probably the most famous example here might be Boris Johnson. He he was anti um, the Heathrow runway, and so despite being a conservative, he has he has said. Even though, even though the runway is going ahead, he has said, I disagree with this. This is not good for my, local, um, for my local area. So the MP constituency link is, is important. I mentioned this in the last video, and, and, and I'm going to make this case that it is a, a strength of first past the post in the first part of this video. But we talked about the winner's bonus in the previous video, the fact that a party with a lot of votes tends to get even more seats. So a party with a high percentage of votes, meaning like 45% of the votes, could end up with maybe 60 or 70% of the seats, which leads to, using the phrase below me here, strong, stable government. It pushes one party well above the others, which means that you get one prime minister and one cabinet that are all from the same party that can try to implement their manifesto. And the argument says that that is strong is because it leads to a government that is united because they're all the same party. They have a manifesto, a program for their 
what, what they intend to do. And they're less likely, although it doesn't always work like this, they're less likely to be kind of torn apart by internal squab squabbling or disagreements or a coalition government that kind of falls apart. Um, it, it, it gives a winner. You know, if you want to put me to put this in a simple term, it gives a winner rather than kind of saying, well, um, you got 45% and you got 30%. So there's no overall winner. It kind of says, well, you got 45%. So you are in charge for the next five years. Uh, which gives a strong government. Now, you might not want a strong government, and we'll come to that when we look at the disadvantages, but the eras of Thatcher's dominance and of Blair's dominance would not have happened without first past the post. And, and even the current government, Boris Johnson's government, would not, if you look at the percentage of votes they've got compared to the percentage of seats they have, first past the post enables Boris Johnson to be a strong prime minister that has that is able to get the vast majority of his legislation and his policies through. I'm just going to move the bar here. I'm not, I'm, there's, a, there's a zoom bar on the screen here where I'm recording it and I, I never know if actually you guys can see this but I'm, if I ever seem to be moving things around on the screen or having a strange fit that's what I'm doing. Now if you're a UKIP supporter I apologize for the point I'm about to make here and I'm being slightly cheeky but um, please understand the point even if you disagree with my example. One of the arguments for first past the post is that it prevents those more kind of like niche or new or perhaps more extreme parties from gaining seats in Westminster. Because we talked about last, last lesson, we talked about the fact that first past the post rewards a high concentration of votes in a single area or indeed a high amount of votes overall. So those parties that tend to get a consistent small amount of votes which actually when you add it up could be millions and millions of people but those parties that only get small but consistent sm amounts of votes do not ever get a plurality in any constituency or very few and therefore they don't get any grip in the house of commons and i'll i'll give you some examples 2015 ukip gets over 10 percent of the vote and gains one seat in the house of commons it prevents niche parties from getting into Parliament. Now, if you are a UKIP fan, you are probably appalled by this. Um, and I completely understand that, that viewpoint. But just go with my view, just go with the point I'm trying to make here for, for a minute. If you see UKIP as a more extreme party for any reason, then first past the post protected the United Kingdom from that party gaining um, many seats in the House of Commons. The same goes for the Green Party. Um, many, some people might see the Greens as a kind of more extreme environmental group outside of the, of the mainstream. First past the post prevents them from gaining many seats. And there have been many incidents throughout the last 40 to 50 years where new parties have been launched or breakaway parties have occurred. And actually first past the post, the system ultimately defeats those parties because even if they get millions of people to vote for them they are unable to really kind of get in to to Westminster and, and the House of Commons um, there's other ones called the the SDP the Social Democratic Party which um, we'll talk about in a, in a future module which was in the 1980s that never never broke through we had Change UK um, in the 2000 17 election, I think, that was a brand new party and it, and it never got anywhere. Um, and one of the reasons they don't get anywhere is not because they don't have support. It's because the electoral system prevents them from gaining seats and then they, they kind of fizzle and, 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 wither, and wither away. The next argument for first past the post is simply tradition. We have had it since essentially whenever, since whenever Parliament has kind of come together. And yes, it's been tweaked because the franchise has been extended and at various points they've kind of changed how many MPs are, are in a particular constituency. But by and large, the system has remained unchanged. And Britain as a country is a pretty traditional country. All you've got to do is walk around London and see all the kind of history there. Um, you know, how many stately homes and castles we have around the place and how many unusual traditions we have in our parliament, such as Black Rod. And the whole place is a palace. It's called the Palace of Westminster. So there is an argument that simply says, this is how we do things in the UK, because this is how we do things in the UK. You should know that a lot of our constitution is based on convention rather than um, codifying a modern document. There, there is a lot about our system, which is simply there because of 
tradition. So why would the voting system not be the same? I'm not saying that's a strong argument, but it's, it is an argument. And it, in many ways is perhaps one of the ones that keeps first past the post going, because actually the risk, if you look at the second half of the sentence there, the risk of change is sometimes scarier for people than the, the risks of staying with what you have or the, or the downsides of, of kind of what you have. Um, there's various phrases like if it ain't broke, don't fix it or better the devil you know or things like that. But there, there are many people that kind of look at first past the post and they go, look, there's a lot of weaknesses and we'll come to them in a second. But all of the other systems have weaknesses as well. And I understand first past the post and I know the weaknesses of it. And actually, I'm, I'm just going to stick with these weaknesses because... Um, the this system is an in a sense tested we understand it we might think that it sucks in some way but we understand this system and we we kind of experienced it so better the devil we know and i think you could make a paragraph that uses that argument another argument for first past the post is that when you go to the ballot paper and i showed you that in the previous video you don't vote for the party conservatives labor lib dems you vote for a person it's the first thing it says whether whether it's you know I don't need to give you examples of names, you understand the word name, but you are voting for individuals and that links to this idea that each MP is accountable and it also gives this idea that it puts faces and individuals into Parliament rather than just kind of like faceless institutions called the Labour Party or the Republican Party. Um, you know who your MP is, hopefully, by name you might well recognize them in the street and 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 so that when you see people interviewed on tv who work in kind of politics you know, these individuals have been voted in um i can remember speaking to various family members and you might have experiences like this where they where they say to you things like well i don't support this particular party but i do like my local mp have you ever had a conversation like that and so um, my dad was an example. He, he, doesn't, he didn't support a political, particular party, but he kept voting for that guy because he actually just liked that guy and he'd met him and he'd kind of formed a bond and, and many people kind of appreciate that and enjoy that kind of individual personal side um, of politics. And the last argument I'm going to give you for first past the post is simply that the country had a chance to change it and we voted not to. In 2010, Nick Clegg and David Cameron, again, individuals, um, worked together in the coalition government between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative Party. And part of their coalition agreement, i.e. part of the agreement to work together, is that they agreed that they would hold a, a referendum on voting change. The Liberal Democrats wanted it, and the Conservative Party didn't want it. And uh, so what happened was they agreed that they were going to hold a referendum. So that was that was the agreed bit. But then they also agreed that they were going to disagree. And so the Liberal Democrats campaigned to change the voting system and the Conservatives campaigned to keep the voting system. It did get a bit bitter at various points and it did put a few cracks in the coalition. And there's various programs about it. And if you, if you get a chance to read um, Nick Clegg's um, biography about this point or Cameron's biography about this point. Um, it's a really interesting kind of story to see how this could have fragmented the coalition. It didn't, mainly because the personal relationships were strong enough um, to survive it. But the referendum took place and the country vote didn't really have an appetite for change. And um, oh, it looks like it looks like the site I was going to show you here doesn't exist anymore. Um, which it which is a shame. But Electoral systems, as you may well have gathered by now, is the kind of thing that politics students and politics teachers like, like you and me get very excited about talking. We talk about the possibilities and we get outraged by the various um, uh, undemocratic elements of various systems. But the average person that isn't a complete, complete politics nerd doesn't really care all that much about constitutions and voting systems and... Um, those kind of intricacies of the separation of powers and, and so on. And it, it's not one of those things, whereas something like Brexit, people have a kind of an emotional reaction to, like you're very, you, most people tend to be a, a passionate Remainer or a passionate Brexiteer, with, with exceptions, of course. People don't have that same kind of feeling or passion or even understanding about electoral systems. And so the referendum had a low turnout and a uh, the vote went to keep first past the post. So you could write an essay that essentially says, you, you could write an essay that says, first past the post sucks because of this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason, and this reason. But ultimately we should keep first past the post because that's what the country voted for. You know, that argument makes sense um, because we had the chance to change it and we as a country did not.
So I keep saying first past the post sucks or, or suggesting that it might suck. Um, but so far, we've kind of built up a pretty strong case that it's actually pretty good. So we better have a really good set of arguments to suggest that it's not very good. So just before we move on, it might be worth you pausing the video here and I'm, there might well be an activity that comes up on the screen. But you know, what for you, what are the key strengths of first past the post? You know, if, if someone said to you, you know, why have we kept this system? What would you say? What would be your top three and, and, and why? And there's lots to talk from there. And there's some really good points there as well. Let's turn our, our views now to the, to the other side. And let's see, now we've built up this wall. Let's see if we can knock it down or let's see if the test stands. Why do some people really not like First Past the Post? There are websites and there are campaigns and political parties that want to scrap this system. Why? The one that always comes up is that it's not proportional. And we saw this in our very first video where, where the SNP gets 45% of the vote in Scotland and they, they take nearly all the seats. And I think in 2015, they did take all the seats except, except one. It's not proportional. UKIP gets 10% of the vote and they get one seat. That is ridiculous. Um, currently speaking, the Conservatives, I think, had something like 43, 44% of the votes and they end up with, a, with a, a, a complete majority in Parliament. It's not proportional. To put it in other words, Parliament does not reflect what people in this country voted for. I'm just going to pause the video here and I'm going to find a web page that illustrates this point so you can see the unproportionality of the system. Okay, so here's a, here's a helpful um, little infographic. Um, you, might want to have a, you might want to pause the video and have a good look at it and try and work out what it's telling you. But we've got 2019, 2017 and 2015. And what we can see here in the top of each line is the, uh, the number, the percentage of seats they get. In the second line, we see the percentage of votes that they've got. So I'll just show you my UKIP example, which I'm, I'm going to use over and over again. But look in the bottom one here. We can see UKIP gets 12% of the vote. I'll round it up. It's actually 13% of the vote. And effectively, and effectively 0% of the seats, you know, that they get one. You can see the Lib Dems also um, get hit badly here because they get this 7.9 percent of the vote and then this tiny little bar of actual um seats but of course uh, I, I should probably make this point more often the snp go the other way the snp because of the concentration of their vote rather than it being kind of spread out all over the place go the other way and and, and they are kind of boosted by it but also don't forget the conservatives and labor here look at this and in many ways this is actually i, I spend a lot of time kind of moaning about the smaller parties here but look at the big parties in 2015, we had a Conservative government. They got 36.8% of the vote and ended up with 50.8% of the seats, which is 51% rounded, which meant that for less than 40% of the vote, they got 100% of the power. Okay? Why am I saying 100% of the power? Because all you need in Parliament to get a law through is more than 50%. You know, every vote is just who has more. And as long as all the Conservatives voted together they could get any law through or cancel any law. So less than 40% of the vote gives them 100% of the power. It didn't happen in 2017 because actually you ended up with a minority government, but effectively then it was even worse because you ended up with a situation where the Conservatives were in power, but they were propped up by one of the minor parties called the DUP, which is a Northern Ireland party. Um, so you end up with a situation where actually they didn't get 48% of the seats and they still win. And here's Boris Johnson's. So here's your figure. He gets 43% of the vote, gets 56% of the seats, which in effect gives him 100% um, of the power. Labour actually for once gets penalised. They get 32% of the vote, but only 31% of seats. You can see here that Labour has actually been more consistent with the percentages compared to, because it tends to reward the winners. Uh, if I was to show you the uh, the Labour Party in the Blair the Blair governments, they also get this massive boost and would have similar percentages and similar seat ratios. I think there's one where they end up above 60% of the seats, um, and so did Thatcher back in them. Uh, the 1980s as well. So this, I hope I've given you enough evidence and examples here to understand this not proportional aspect. And I hope you can see why some people think this is a very strong argument um, against first past the post, that it distorts the result, throwing out smaller parties and boosting the winner to a point where they get 100% of the power. It also leads, as you should understand from previous videos, um, to safe seats and wasted votes. So in the previous slide, I said, well, look, every MP is accountable, but actually we know there are 
350 MPs in the country that realistically are not accountable. They live in a safe seat where the Conservatives will always win, and if the Conservatives don't change their candidate, they're always going to win. If and, and the, the same in reverse. And there are many, many wasted votes. If you are a Labour supporter in Beaconsfield, your vote is, going, is not going to count in the slightest. If, and I can give you lots of examples from around the country, but if you, if you are a minority party supporter in that area, not even necessarily across the whole country, but just in that area, there's no point in you voting, um, to be blunt. There's no, because there's no chance of your vote having any difference to on the, in, on the impact. Um, I, I don't know how much I should give my opinions on this, but if, if I was going to pick a problem with first past the post, it might be this one I would go for because I've met, obviously, obviously I talk about politics a lot and I, I've met many people now that say, that say, look, there's just no point me voting in my area. I, I support this party, but in where I live, this party always wins. It's a safe seat. There's no point me voting. My vote is wasted. And how democratic can you really say a country is if you get people that say there's no point me voting um, in my particular area? And this leads to the fact that then no votes are not of equal value. And I'll use the example of where I live in Watford versus perhaps where you guys live in, in, in Beaconsfield. Um, a vote in Watford is far more valuable to a political party than a vote in Beaconsfield because... Watford is a swing seat and Beaconsfield is not. And therefore the parties will work much harder to gain my vote than yours. So although technically our votes are of equal of value, one person, one vote, in political reality, that is not the case because the parties don't need to work hard to win your vote because it's a safe seat, but they do need to work hard to win mine because they need my vote far more than yours to make a difference in the election. It also encourages tactical voting, and I've used a little kind of football analogy here, and we talked about that in the previous video, and you should know what tactical voting is, but now I want to kind of explore the idea that, that that's not really a good thing. It's a workaround, it's a, it's a loophole, it's a way of kind of going, well, I don't like this system, and I, I'll use an example here of the Green Party. You know, let's say I'm a Green Party supporter, there's no chance in hell um, that the Green Party are gonna win where I live, so I have to, if I want my vote to count at all, I've got to vote tactically and vote for a party that I don't really support, but I just happen to like them more than I like a different party. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with tactical voting, but I am making the argument here that we shouldn't have a system where you have to kind of tactical vote. You should be able to vote for the party that you genuinely like. That would be far more democratic. And as a result of that, and we're using the kind of the counter argument to our previous slide here, it prevents new and smaller parties. UKIP arguably should have got a big grip on the House of Commons, 10% of the seats. The Green Party should be sitting with 5% of the seats consistently. The Lib Dem should be sitting with um, 10, 15% um, consistently. And when I say should here, I'm using it from a proportional point of view. If, you, if you're tra literally translating votes to seats, and I, I apologize if I'm using too, too kind of emotive language here, but you can see that if a brand new party was launched tomorrow, and even if millions of people across the UK supported it, it wouldn't win. And this is one of the things that kind of keeps Labour and the Conservative Party dominant, is it's not necessarily that they are the best parties, although they might be. It's not necessarily that they have the best policies and the best politicians, although they might do. But even if there were new parties and new politicians, they would find it very, very hard to actually get into Parliament because the electoral system kind of keeps them out. And, and you can argue that as an advantage or a disadvantage, but you can see the impact. And then all of these things kind of go together, really. You, you can kind of say, well, well, just imagine. I don't know if I pick a, a different party here. But OK, let, let's use the Liberal Democrats. Let's use it because the Liberal Democrats are a fairly central party. If the Liberal Democrats scored uh, a seat ratio, which was more proportional to their vote ratio in the next general election, they would, their influence in Parliament would shoot up this time. And also, many more people would then look at them as potential winners next time. Now, you remember that term party system, one party system, two party system, three party system, multi party system. People don't tend to vote for parties that they can't see winning, because why would you? You'd, wa you'd waste your votes. And so 
our political system actually stops parties starting to move up that ladder. You know, the Liberal Democrats should be, and, and UKIP and the Green Party should, should be on that first and second rung. People should start to see them as potential winners. And if they see them as potential winners, they might support them more. And you might then get a continual rise of that particular party, which is kind of what happened to the SNP in Scotland. They moved from being a niche party to being a contender. And once they were a contender, they won. They, and they are now the dominant party, both in the Scottish um, Westminster seats and also in the Scottish Parliament itself, which is why the first minister in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, comes from the SNP, because people saw them as potential winners. So not only does the, the, the voting system actually keep the smaller parties out, it perhaps even stops the smaller parties getting support in the first place or growing or being seen as potential um, winners. So the impact there here is pretty good. I've made this point already, but I, I want to give it its own um, slice of the cake to go with it. The winning party always has less than 50% of the vote. So I've given us half a cake here. And you saw it with the, the other slide that I showed you, is that I don't believe, at least in, in the modern era, there has been a situation where the party that has all of the power in the country has over 50% of the vote. Meaning that, let's put this in blunt terms, there are always more people that have voted against the party in government than for it. Whether you look at Boris Johnson, Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, John Major, Gordon Brown, you know, whoever it might be, there have always been more people in the country that voted for someone else than voted for them. And yet those individuals and those parties have had complete control of the country. Other voting systems would force coalitions that could claim more support or would force a situation where uh, uh, more people would vote for particular groups by redistributing votes. And we'll come back to what that means um, in the future. And does it always provide strong and stable government? We didn't have a clear winner in 2010. We ended up with a coalition. We didn't have a clear winner in 2017. And even in 2015, and to an extent in 2019, the majorities are relatively small. Yeah, you, you saw in 2015, the Conservatives only had a few seats over. Boris Johnson has more, to be fair. Um, but have we now entered a new era where actually first past the post no longer delivers um, strong and stable government. That's up to you and to gaze into your crystal balls and kind of make that case. So an example essay, what kind of question would you get looking at the, the topics that we've looked at over the last um, few lessons? Well, you could get a question that asks you to look at some of the other political systems, other electoral systems, but you could get a question specifically on first past the post because it's named on the exam paper. So something like evaluate the extent to which the strengths of first past the post outweigh its weaknesses. Um, it, it asks you purely to evaluate it on its own terms, not necessarily bringing in other systems to put the strengths against the weaknesses and say, well, are the strengths better than the weaknesses or are the weaknesses better than the strengths? And to kind of make that case. Um, in my view, it would be a, a pretty straightforward essay to write and, and something that is pretty easy to kind of get ex examples for and, and hopefully one that's a lot of fun that you can really kind of get your teeth stuck into. So, so where do you go from here? In our next video, we will, will of course be asking, well, what are the other systems? And we'll be going through um, them in turn and, and, and learning about them. But for now, where do you need to be? You need to know, you know, probably five or six arguments um, for it and five or six arguments against it, maybe narrowing it down to like your top three on each side. But you also need to start to have an opinion here. Should we keep first past the post? Do you think its strengths outweigh its weaknesses or its weaknesses outweigh its strengths? And over the next few weeks, you can also then start to add in, well, do I think it should be replaced by X or Y? Or after you've looked at the other systems, will you eventually come back and say, I've looked at the other systems and actually, you know what? I prefer first past the post. That's where you should be. And that is where we're going. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Uh, please like it and subscribe to the channel and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.